the most important things about M&A to know for an interview invest banking, to be honest, is uh, how to do like accretion dilution calculations. Um, when you get to more advanced like interviews, like super days, you might see some of these. Now, I doubt you'll ever see this in like a in a, in a first round, but we'll jump into some of these uh, interesting type questions. Okay, so first of all, what kind of M&A happens? Um, the most common is horizontal, right? Just trying to increase revenue, gain access to a new market, gain access to a new customer base. Maybe you have a similar customer base and you want to cross sell a complementary product, right? Like you're a bank, you acquire, uh, I don't know, some wealth management firm and you're like, oh, well, we can combine your products with our products. You know, we've seen this a million times. Vertical used to be a lot more common less common now because it's basically acquiring up the supply chain to save on costs. What people have found over time is that um, it's, it's better to just kind of specialize in what you know. So like if you're a CEO and you're trying to manage like five completely different businesses, it's really hard. And that's also why conglomerates have become less popular uh, over time. So horizontal is now the more common. Of course, we have financial sponsor, which has particularly been growing at a breakneck speed because private equity offers returns that public equities simply do not. I mean, we're talking like 20% returns, right? Like it's, that's pretty good. Um, synergies. So the most common synergies are really cost synergies because you can, you can identify what you can eliminate, right? We don't need two headquarters, get rid of that building. We don't need, you know, kind of redundant SGNA or whatever it is. Um, you know, economies of scale. Unfortunately, sometimes layoffs do happen, but not always. Uh, a lot of P firms will actually try to grow as opposed to layoffs. So um, that's sort of a stereotype, I would say. Um, but I did put it in there. <laughs> Revenue synergies are harder to quantify. They're important, but you know, because they're it's 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 going to take a bit of uh, guesswork to figure out exactly how much money you're going to make from uh, revenue synergies whether it's expansion or other things, new products. Um, some of these are less important. These are kind of more like detail-oriented stuff. Why, why m and deals fail? That, that one's easy. Um, CEOs have egos and they have um, a desire for more prestige and more salary and more everything. <laughs> so it's, it's natural to understand why that bias might occur. Uh, sometimes we forget that megalith corporations are actually led by real human beings with actual emotions. Okay, so um, common question interview, walk me through a sell side process. Like what does an investment bank actually do? You'd be surprised at the number of people who go into investment banking jobs who have no idea what they're about to do. <laughs> um, in, in short, investment banks more or less focus on two products. They do a lot of other products, but they focus on two, which is the IPO and the merger slash acquisition. Um, if you're, let's say a bank is representing a company to sell, right? Um, and let's say it's a broad auction because that matters, right? Because if, if you're finding, let's say you find a company and it's very sensitive, you don't want to give away the competitive information. You might be very narrow in who you approach, but let's say this is a very broad auction. This, let's say they approach 20 buyers, right? You find 20 buyers, um, they'll send what's called like a one page teaser and then a confidentiality agreement. And if they sign that agreement, they'll send the full slide deck, which is called a confidential information memorandum. It's about 50 to 70 slides. So based on this, the firms will make an initial bid. Now, round two, let's say we pick five people to, to, to go through, right? Now we can actually give them access to all our files, which we'll dump into the data room. So they're gonna be digging through everything answering questions from the, they're, they're going to be visiting the management, visiting the site. And in the end, they're going to come up with an offer on a legal document that's called a sales and purchase agreement. Finally, the third round, by now you've narrowed it down to one buyer. And now this buyer is going to want to spend money. They're going to pay accountants, um, consultants. They're going to do environmental due diligence, management due diligence, all every single due diligence you can think of. And that's going to cost cash, which is why it's got to be exclusive that third round most of the time. That's how the process works. And that's what, the, as you can imagine, like this is going to be very hard for most companies to do. So that's why they hire investment banks. How do we finance an acquisition? 
Well, three ways. And as, you, as cash is the cheapest, the cost of cash is merely the opportunity cost of cash, which sometimes could just be a 1% return on T-bills or less, right? Um, debt, debt, that's cheaper than equity because it's you know less risky. These are very common multiples that banks will use to determine if a company can borrow more or not, right? So take a look at these. These are really like, especially this, this is probably the most common. Like if I'm a PE firm and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not talking to people saying, oh, I'm going to buy this company with 70% debt, right? That, that makes me sound like an amateur, right? I'm going to, I'm going to say I'm buying this with five times de uh, debt and people will automatically know that's five times you could die if they're in the, in the industry, right? So it's, um, it's, that's, that's the most common way. Stock. Stock's the most expensive, right? You'd only use stock if your stock is high, but, or if you can't borrow more. Okay, let's go through a merger model. What is a merger model? Sounds complicated. It's actually not as complicated as you imagine, maybe. All you're doing is combining two net incomes. A merger model is simply smashing two income statements together. It's, it's pure addition. Now, obviously, there are adjustments, <laughs> and that's where the complexity is. We have to adjust for synergies. Um, any transaction costs? And if we borrow more debt, we're going to have additional interest expense. Now, if we're financing part of this through um, equity, we're going to have to issue new shares. So we're going to have to divide by a new shares of standing that might be larger than the original. And we're going to get to a new EPS. And if this EPS is higher, it's accretive. If it's lower, it's dilutive. That's all it is. Now, in advanced interviews, you might get questions where they actually give you numbers, kind of similar to here. And all you got to do is just calculate them, right? Like, I won't go through an example, but it's it's straightforward. It's like, oh, okay, smash them together, figure out your debt, figure out your equity situation, divide. Great. Um, now, there's another kind of advanced question that you might encounter. These are very advanced questions, by the way. So if you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry. Honestly, the first, uh, the DCF and the EV slash comps sections are probably more relevant for like less, like, you know, non-super day interviews. Um, so I was trying to find a good example of something here. Um, yeah, here's here's a good example. Sometimes you will be asked if, it, if a transaction is accretive or dilutive, but you will not be told um, the income or the revenue or whatever. Instead, you'll be told, you know, the, uh, the cost of capital. So in this question, we're given the cost of capital, as you can see, cost of cash, cost of debt, cost of equity, as well a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so how can we think about this? Well, if it's accretive, what I'm buying should deliver a higher return than my cost of capital. If my capital costs 2% and what I'm getting is returning 10%, it's accretive. Okay, so what am I earning by buying this company? Well, what am I buying, first of all? I'm buying um, company B, right? And company B um, has a price of earnings ratio. Uh, we know the price, 800 million. Um, and we know the 20% because that's from here, their 20% net income margin. Um, so this is an example of where they're using that income margin to figure it out. Now, let's, let's just ignore the net, net income margin. Sorry, this concept is actually kind of confusing. So I'm actually gonna avoid talking about that. Let's, let's not talk about that. What I'm more focused on this is this. Um, sorry, that's a typo, my apologies there. Let me correct that. I'm more interested in this because I'm going to pay 800 million for 80 million of earnings. What does that actually mean? Well, if I flip that around, that that's basically saying I'm going to be earning 80 million if I pay 800 million. So in other words, if I divide 80 into 800, or if I just simply flip this multiple around, I get 10%. So we're making PE 
and changing it to E over P, earnings over price. Um, so this 10% is, is what I would earn if I bought this company, right? Because that's, that's what it is. That's what their P is. Now, I just got to find the cost of capital if, and see if it's higher or lower than that 10% of, um, of the target return. So to do this, I'm going to use this formula here. It's actually just the WAC formula. So you've seen this already, but I added in cash too. So there's a interest on cash um, times percent of your cash. Now, what's important here is when I say cost of debt, I actually mean after tax. So you actually have to multiply by one minus the tax rate and same with the cash. So that's probably the easiest thing to get lost in. And after you just do this math, you're going to realize it's 6%. So what you're earning is actually quite higher than what, what the capital costs. So it is accretive. 